Kassen wrote a marvelous book called The Sea Runners. And uh, this made her financially independent. And then she could work on her book that we made her even more famous, that is The Silent Spring. Uh, so she became the mother of the, the conservation movement. And uh, my admiration for her is, is uh, expressed in the fact that I named my research project, it started 20 years ago uh, at UBC, I named the Sea Runners. So there we are. And um, we are now going to talk about the fisheries of the world. And you will see that uh, the fisheries of the world, uh, we, we, the fisheries of the world are very similar to the, what happens in on the island. And it will provide you a context for which to judge what happens here. So we begin uh, as about a few hundred thousand, million years ago in Africa, we were part of the ecosystem then as prey. We were part of the ecosystem. We were like a forage fish. Uh, <laughs> the higher hips. And um, then we, we cease to be a prey and a part of the ecosystem uh, because we invented speech. We invited collaboration, and uh, then we, we started uh, impacting <coughs> our ecosystem next. Uh, our first, the first evidence that we have of uh, the seafood use is uh, a cave in South Africa where people have recovered abalone shells that were consumed and then used to hold paint, ochre, that was used to as is used for symbolists, for, for, for painting ourselves. And uh, painting ourselves is, uh, is a way to acquire an identity that is separate from that of others. And uh, symbolic painting uh, will, will is associated with that. Next. Uh, the first evidence of harpoons, very completed weapon, or tools or weapons, uh, is from the, what is now the Congo and is uh, uh, 90,000 years ago. Uh, that is, people before people, modern human, began to go to, out of Africa and come to British Columbia. Uh, <laughs> uh, next. Um, and uh, people, as you know, moved out of Africa about 70,000 years ago and uh, started peopling uh, the, the world. Next. And every time we arrived, modern humans arrived in, a, in an island or in a continent that they had not people before, the big animals were wiped out. The big herbivores were wiped out because they were consumed, and the big carnivores were wiped out because they had no prey. This happened either, this happened in Europe, this happened in America. The numbers uh, are the number of genera. The species were far more, but the, the, the genera that we wiped out uh, in Madagascar about 1,000 years ago, in, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand, only a few hundred years ago, uh, in South and North America, about 15,000 years ago, and so on. Only in Africa uh, do, did we not uh, wipe out all, all, all so many species because people knew that an ape on two, wheat, on two legs with pointed sticks are dangerous. Uh, the animals co-evolved with us and knew that. Next. The, the next big thing that we invented is, uh, is agriculture, which, um, which uh, had several low, low uh, places where uh, wheat in the Middle East, rice in East Asia, and, uh, and uh, millet in West Africa, potato and, uh, in South America, and uh, corn in North America, where, where became the focus of major civilization. And this civilization had one negative aspect next. Uh, this is desertification. And desertification is uh, very severe. Uh, when you see some news from the Middle East, for example, from Iraq, you, you cannot believe that uh, a few thousand years ago, there was uh, uh, a fertile ground that was green as, as green as this island. Uh, Babylon was very rich and very, uh, very very, very green, uh, and it became uh, salinized, salinized uh, became, uh, they had to move from wheat 
to barley, which is more salt, salt tolerant. Right now we are losing lots of salts everywhere. And uh, this is uh, well summarized in a, in a book uh, that the uh, University of California published, uh, The Erosion of Civilization. And uh, it showed that uh, a civilization lasted about two, three hundred years, and then they had ruined their salts. And this applied, strangely enough, also to the US. Um, because the US Civil War, you may recall, was not about the maintenance of slavery in the South. It was about the expansion of slavery in the West. And uh, they, why did they want to expand? Among other things, because uh, raising tobacco and cotton is destroying the land. Now, uh, I could go on with deforestation, but you can see where I'm going. Next. next. Uh, the next culture that, that uh, spread in a wild way is the Polynesians, the migration, the Australian migration, to be more precise, which started in Taiwan. The ancestors of the Polynesian, Indonesian, uh, uh, Filipino, and so on, were started in Taiwan, where dialects uh, similar to, to the language of Polynesia uh, are still spoken. And uh, this was an expansion of agronomists or also of agricultural people they they raise crops and every time they arrive somewhere they raise crops and they were very efficient but half of the birds were wiped out in hawaii and everywhere uh, and uh, <coughs> this uh, they range uh, extremely wide madagascar is in the process of being completely desertified and the fauna completely wiped out next the next big jump, the next big expansion is obviously, and the history lesson will stop here, uh, the, uh, uh, the expansion of industrialization started in England and ended up with China being now the major steel producer. Now, what can you do with steel? Next, you can do big boats. And our story of fisheries began with industrial fishing because we have been fishing all the time. But we could not really, we were limited in depth in how far offshore we could go, whether we could go in winter or because, because the ice, because of storm. These boats were the first that didn't have to bother much about distance, deep depth, and uh, storms because they were big and they were steel boats. They were steamboats. And England began to deploy them in 1880. And within 10 years, around, around the British Isles, the stocklets of herring that were exactly the same as those along the BC coast were all wiped out. And herring could be fished only in open North Sea. So each bay in England, in the UK, had each bay had a stocklet of, uh, of uh, of uh, herring uh, and other other fish, and incidentally, these stocklets. Uh, I I don't like to be a professor, but it's not because they they don't go to the place where they spawn because the older fish tell them to do that. They do that because they are imprinted to the to a site where they are born, the same way that uh, salmon are imprinted to a place, and so uh, the fish go back to spawn at the place where they were born or hatched because they imprinted in the first hours of life. And uh, the, the, the same applies to herring as, as applied to salmon. And if you devastate, if you empty a place from uh, remove all herring that are imprinted to that place, you can only get them back if uh, uh, some, some imprinting of other stocks has errors. So the, the same as salmon, a river, a run in a river, if you extirpate it, if you eliminate it, is, is not gonna, the river is not gonna be used by the other salmon. Only the, the one that I imprinted that, that commit a mistake go to that river and they become the ancestor of the, of the new run. Anyway, so in the UK, about the, the stocks, the, the the fishery uh, developed like crazy. Then uh, we staged World War One, World War Two. Uh, this is peace for the fish, 
because uh, the North Sea was mined and you, you could not, and also the fisher went to war. And now the UK has declining catch, but it has about 5% of the fish that it had before, 5%. And, and uh, the UK uh, citizen, uh, they eat fish that comes from outside. Uh, about in the EU, EU and now England separately, UK separately, because they're not in the EU anymore. Uh, about 80% of the fish is imported. Uh, in the US, it's uh, also about 70 80%. In Japan, it's the same number. And Canada has also become a net importer of fish, which was, it was before net export of fish. Uh, it was, for example, it was uh, cod was uh, exported to Europe and also to the Caribbean for to maintain the, the slave population there. Uh, but now uh, cod, uh, Canada has become a net importer of fish. If you go to Granville Island, our fish market in Vancouver, you cannot eat. They are salmon and they are oysters from, from BC. That's all. Everything else come from outside. Next. So, would you have seen this picture in the previous presentation? Uh, we have phytoplankton, zooplankton, crayfish, such as your herring, and you have top predators such as salmon and uh, uh, tuna and so on. And then we have the fishery that tends to fish the top predators. Now, when it doesn't fish the herrings, uh, uh, the, the, the food that is produced, the, uh, the food that is produced. Uh, at one level, about 90% is lost as it goes up. So um, the transfer efficiency is only 10%. So if you cannot really add one ton of tuna with one ton of sardine. You have obviously two tons of fish, but it, it's, it's really like adding a ton of cow and a ton of hay. You, it, it's not really comparable. So you can express that what you have uh, in terms of phytoplankton, you, if you have one ton of uh, tuna, you can say that's equivalent to 10 tons of crayfish, which is equivalent to 100 tons of zooplankton, which is equivalent to 100 tons or 5,000 tons of phytoplankton. So you express all the catch of the world in, in plankton. And then next, and then uh, there is a huge database that we have created. Uh, it has, uh, it has uh, lots of uh, information about fish. It's called Fish Base. You can see, go we'll see all fish in the world that are represented 35,000. And you can get uh, the so called trophic level, the level at which this animal operates 4 or 3.5 or 4.1, and so on. Because, because fish are not exactly at 1, 2, 3, or 4, but uh, they eat a mix of things. So you get the so-called trophic level from, from there, for example. And then next, well, we know how much phytoplankton is being produced uh, from satellite uh, uh, maps. So we, we, we know how much is used by the fishery uh, operating in different parts of the world, and we know how much uh, is produced. So we can do for each place in the world the ratio of, of what is produced to what is used, or what is used to what is produced. Next. So, no, 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 watch it, don't move. This is the <laughs> primary production required. So how much of the grass in the sea we use? And that is a, a good measure of our impact on the sea. And it's a good measure of the, of the way fishery use the world, use the ocean. Now, you will see, we have mapped that, and you will see that uh, really the red values, 20% or more, 50% of the primary production use is, was around the industrialized country in 1950, around the industrialized countries of the world, because they had these big boats. And the rest of the world, it was, the rest of the world were fishing coastally, but they didn't have much. And uh, Japan, you can see the, the, the fact that Japan also was at the same level as Europe. Now, uh, you will be pressing about with half a second between 65 times, and you will get trigger finger at the end, but <laughs> that will be the evolution of fisheries 
in 65 years. Lots of work. Yeah, wow. No, wow, you say later. <laughs> <laughs> too fast, too fast. Oh. <laughs> we stop in 14. Uh, no, go back. Okay, so you have this. What we catch in the open sea is far less in absolute quantity, in like tons per square kilometer. But relative to the primary production, relative to the production of grass, uh, it is as big as in, as in shore. We now fish the ocean, at least uh, a significant part of this, for example, in, in Tuna Alley uh, uh, in Indonesia, in the, in the west and, and in the tropical zones. We now exploit the ocean with the same intensity as the coastal areas of the world. We have, we have done quite a career from the time we were prey of big birds in Africa <laughs> to that. that. That, what I have shown you, is a transition of humans to, into a, a force that modifies everything. It modifies uh, the fauna, the big terrestrial fauna, you have seen that. It modifies the flora through agriculture and desertification. We modify, and then we, we do the same thing. Modification of the fauna, the killing all the animals, the large animals, and then the, the smaller things. In Hornby Island, we massacred the fish, the little fish. And that is happening on a grand scale. Now, this, this method of operation uh, generated catch. And it generated big catches, and then it doesn't anymore. Continue. Next. Uh, so you can look at this. This is uh, for the whole world. But you can look at this for individual countries. For example, China in 50, that the scale is kilometer, square kilometer per ton, ton. It's not in primary production required, it's in ton per square kilometer. But uh, you can see China in 50s, next. And that is China in uh, 2014. Now, nothing against China, because uh, the same could be done to Spain, South Korea, France, Japan, and so on. Um, we fish everywhere. And incidentally, this stuff is available on our website, searounders.org. And you can download the data, come down on the map and stuff. Next. We also fish deeper. The, it, is, uh, it is for big Spanish or South Korean trawler, it's, a, it's an obvious thing that they can fish at a one kilometer depth. I, I was, in, as a student, in 73 on the German uh, research vessel. That was a research vessel that was a converted commercial vessel. I was fishing in uh, Labrador and Newfoundland, and we were <coughs> lifting uh, rocks the size of Volkswagen, uh, together with tons and tons of cod that we took uh, the length of the otoliths, the little bones, the ear bones, and we threw away the fish. And it was a giant mess. And uh, that's where we fish. We fish now at depth of one kilometer, one and a half kilometer. What had maintained the cod in Canada is the fact that people could not fish. Uh, the traps were reaching about 50 meters, and the long line, the, the lines that people use from the boats, from the sailing boats, they reach about 100 meters. Uh, we, we, we could access the money from that cod bank only through tellers or through cods that wanted to commit suicide and came to the surface. <laughs> we could not access the treasure in the bank. Now we have broken open the bank and the treasure, and we have we can extract <coughs> all the money we want anytime we want from anywhere. And that is uh, why uh, cod, for example, which uh, has uh, was sustaining a catch of 100,000, 150,000 tons for five centuries. Then the catch increased to 
what, 700,000 pumps for a few years, and then the whole thing collapsed to nothing. The fishery had to be closed in 92. Next. So, how it is done? Well, it's done by uh, an immense uh, development of this fishing power that I, I illustrated with the steam trawlers in 1980, except that they are now diesel, and except that they are now uh, 20 times, 200 times more powerful on a, on a same length basis than the trawlers that uh, the English uh, unlashed in under the 80. And now a trawler is uh, 20 to 50 times more effective at catching fish than, than, than they were then. And uh, the, the, this is the horsepower of the engine added. You can not add number of boats because a small boat and a small large boat don't do the same. But you can add the horsepower of the engine because, because that is the uh, direct measure of the effort and the cost of fishing. And you can see you can see that North America is uh, not going very fast, Oceania, that is Australia, and so on. The, the action is in, in Asia and Europe. Next. So the, what uh, would, you would have seen yesterday, the film had worked, is uh, we, have, we have reconstructed the catch of the world. Because the catch of the world is is um, if you want if you want to know how much is really caught in Hornby in the area, you can actually count the boats. You can count. You can get a good idea of it. If you want to know it for Canada, you can perhaps ask the DFO. But if you want to know for the entire Americas, there is only one institution in the world that has data from different countries. That is the FAO. Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, one of the technical organizations of the United Nations, and it's in Rome. All countries send, send to Rome every year <coughs> catches. The DFO send catches from, from uh, Canada to Rome, and, and, uh, and so does Kenya and uh, Indonesia. And these catches are incomplete, and they are incomplete in different ways. Uh, in, uh, for example, in this country, uh, recreation catches are not answered, and uh, the catch by uh, Inuit is not uh, uh, is not sent, and neither as is a foreign catch that are made in uh, w the waters of this sea are not sent in. So the you, the idea that you get from looking at uh, catch data from the official catch data is completely wrong. So we have conducted a huge project uh, over a period of 15 years, cost of the money, uh, of catch reconstruction. And this is essentially a, a jigsaw for it. Next. So you, you, you start with the official catch, and you end up with a reconstructed catch. And that's a reported catch plus unreported. And uh, we, the re unreported catch, we get all kinds of sources because uh, for example, uh, sports fishery, sports fishery uh, in various countries is documented, but it's not part of the official catch. The discard, the fish that we discard go overboard, is not reported, but its data are available on. So uh, it's lots of work, but it's it's not difficult to do, and we have done it, mm -hmm. um, and we have published uh, atlases and papers and so on. Um, uh, and they are all available on our website. You can see them next. And uh, for Canada, the West Coast, the black line is uh, is the officially reported catch, mm -hmm. and the total is the, the reconstructed catch. Uh, actually, this reconstruction was published uh, six, seven years ago. Actually, our present reconstruction has more catch. Uh, that was not reported because this doesn't include much of uh, of um, the foreign catch, uh, the Poland and uh, Germany and so on in the 60s, 70s were fishing hake in uh, in uh, BC and that is not reported. 
And so we have found a source that give it, and uh, these uh, results that you can see in our website uh, are constantly updated. We are have the updated to 2016, and 2016 has more data. Yep. And when added up, all the catches of the world, uh, you get uh, the reported catch, that's what FAO reports, and uh, you get hours, and that is, um, there is a difference. And uh, the difference is that uh, we catch about 50% 50 50 more, so 100, 150% of what is officially reported. Uh, actually, certain big countries, uh, um, the US, for example, has only 10, 15% more. And other countries, especially developing countries, have two, three times more. Um, uh, some extreme countries uh, have up to five, six times more because they report only the catch that they export as caught, and the rest doesn't matter. That tells you a lot about what matters to the, to the fisheries department of these countries when they report only the tuna catch and don't report the catch that feeds the people in their country. That, that makes the stuff that happens here, um, a walk in the park, because it's far worse. No? The, the, the food base uh, of your country, you don't even know that it exists, because uh, that is, for example, in uh, Central America, uh, Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, and so on. They, they report only what they export the shrimp and the lobsters and uh, all the other fishes not the food. And so we have this enormous difference. And why is the, the, the decline more rapid than for us than officially? Because the official data tend to tend to improve over time uh, from lousy to halfway acceptable in certain countries. And when they improve, they, they catch statistics. They don't fix them retroactively. So a country will report only, only its exports, and then uh, they hear that uh, they, they have also to report what, uh, what is consumed in the country, and so they add it, but it's not done retroactively. And so they have an increase in catch, uh, even though the catch is going down effectively, uh, they, but they, the reported catch has an increase in catch. We call this the presentist bias. You, you give more emphasis to the present and past, and this is the reason why our catch reconstructed uh, declined fast. So we published that, everybody was upset. Uh, uh, you can imagine uh, FAO was very upset and so on, but uh, it, it's, they are now accepting it next. And uh, in 98, uh, prior to this conducting this project, we had already identified what is the major process with which changes, humans uh, impose change on the ocean. It is when fishing begins, when, when you acquire the capability of, of catching all the fish. Because we don't, we don't have it. We didn't have it before, uh, the ability of catching all the fish. That's the reason, for example, why shark, fin, shark fins uh, uh, soup is a delicacy because only how do you catch a shark? It's difficult if you don't have a big boat, right? I mean, they don't like them to be caught, themselves to be caught, and so on. So only the emperor and, and his buddies could afford to eat shark fins. That's the reason why shark fins are so popular because, because they were only the very rich people could afford. And, uh, and so we have. When you, when you are capable, because of technical, the technical development in the fishery, catching everything, you will tend to catch big things. And for example, in the UK, uh, when industrial fishing began, they were catching huge halibut. Uh, also, these halibuts are also known to have occurred here. Uh, now they are smaller, so they, everything gets smaller. And then after a while, these big fish are gone, and you, you, you are fishing the middle fish, which are either the juvenile or the big ones or, or middle fish. And then you go down and then you end up with, with only having herring and, and sardine and anchovies. And then you, 
you will fish them also too much, and then then you have nothing. And 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 that this having nothing has to be nuanced because uh, uh, you have jellyfish that pops up, and if you like jellyfish, there you are. Or or you have a fishery for for um, for sea cucumbers developing, and sea cucumbers. See, we, the, tr we the, the trophic level goes down. The animals, you, you go down the food chain. That, uh, what do sea cucumbers eat? Dirt. They eat dirt. Sea cucumbers eat dirt. So you, you cannot uh, get further down, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but if, if, if the market demand is, is for uh, an animal that eats dirt, like sea cucumber and shrimp, they eat worms and things uh, that make dirt. Uh, so you can have a fishery maintained by animals that you export that are actually we would never we would never, have, never eaten before. Now now we there is a market for them. And so we are scraping the bottom of the sea. And uh, this nice flower that you see in the bottom are not flowers, these are animals. We have scraping them off of by trawling uh, from the bottom of the sea, and we have uh, turned everything into mud flats. Next, it is it, it is the case also in this in the BC. Uh, you see, in the, the 1800, they they had lots of clams, lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, low trophic level animals, abalone and stuff, and then uh, industrialization came up, and then we were catching lots of big fish. Uh, in the beginning of the century, and then, as as uh, as uh, as is expected everywhere, uh, we fish them down. And then, now now, uh, for example, in the Georgia Strait, it, it was lean cod. I remember uh, uh, have a friend who has a boat, and he has old books on his boat, and uh, they were saying in this thing from the 60s that uh, it's a pity when you fish. You try to fish tuna and uh, sorry, uh, salmon, and you get a uh, ling cod because you they were like pest. Ling cod now are almost exterminated from the Gulf Strait, and if there are any, they are small. Uh, so this happened. Okay, next. So uh, that is to show that it is uh, happening everywhere. This stuff. Next, and and it is important that you realize what happens if you let this process continue. If you say, well, you fish the big ones, and then you fish the small one, you fish the herring. What happens if you let this happen? Well, you might uh, fish them stuff. I don't know how you call it, slop. I call it slop. Uh, this is, uh, at the end of this arrow, you have a mixture of juvenile fish, uh, jellyfish, plankton, and uh, this is handled with bulldozers in China. And now, China, Thailand, and a few countries practice deliberately a fishery that was a Why? Because they don't need to bother about the fishers uh, using two small meshes. They have given up on controlling that. The, the, the mesh size limit is two centimeters in China, but they use uh, 0.5, 0. 0.8 centimeters. That's, um, that is uh, eight millimeters or seven millimeters mesh that catch that stuff, and they have a market for it. Which one? Aquaculture. Mm -hmm. So you get nice big fish based on massacring your natural resource, and that is uh, you will find lots of people in the aquaculture industry telling you it's fine. Actually, it's not because these fish become edible for us only if you go if they go through the the stomach of another fish. And that is a, a huge loss. Next. So why this madness? Why, why this madness? Uh, because essentially, uh, this uh, is encouraged and subsidized by governments. Uh, uh, that uh, also is valid for Canada. Uh, the subsidies uh, that uh, is takes various forms. For example, I pay me 
with my taxes, there is two. <coughs> my taxes, I'm not complaining because I, taxes is a good thing. But but uh, two of my uh, my taxes is enough to support two uh, new fee fishermen. Uh, they, they get uh, support if they work for two weeks or a few weeks, ten weeks or something. Uh, that that is that's uh, one form of taxes of subsidies. The France is uh, lots of subsidies, China is lots of subsidies. But basically, you start with fishery that should earn their own, because fisheries don't generate, don't, don't produce fish. They just collect fish that nature produce, right? It should be profitable. Uh, uh, a fishery should be profitable inherently, because you don't do anything. It's not like farming or no manufacturing. But these fisheries that we have now, because the biomass is so low everywhere, they they require taxpayers' money, and so they they can they can maintain boats afloat that should be not fish that should not be fishing, and this because they don't catch fish, they have to expand, they have to go somewhere else, and you saw the result of this expansion, and then uh, they devastate everything, like your last talk of Eric. And then, uh, then they have to have subsidies to continue, and so on. And this, this, uh, this is a picture. The only picture that my project has not generated it comes from Europe, but it could be used in Asia. It could be used in, in uh, North, uh, in other continent. So, next, um, basically, I'm sorry. This is. I'm a professor also. Um, <laughs> basically, you have uh, in Y uh, uh, the uh, yield that you can transform into money. You have in, uh, in the yield, what you can catch is uh, parabolic. Uh, if, if, at your, your, if you fish right, you will generate a maximum sustainable yield or maximum economic yield where the difference between the cost, the cost line, uh, and the return line is biggest. That's maximum economic yield. In Australia, it is a law that fisheries must be managed such that they produce maximum economic yield because uh, society benefits most. You could say MSY is also good, maximum sustainable yield, because it produces lots of fish, which has downstream effect. But what we do, we, we don't do any of that, and they fish all the way to open access equilibrium which means they just earn their living. They just break even. You could say, well, that's all right. It will stabilize at some reasonable level. But it doesn't, because at that point, yesterday somebody asked, how come they make the decision all the time? And you know what? That's because the big uh, fleet owners play golf, and the ministers also. So they can talk. So they can talk. I, I say that in large places. And uh, one time I remember a parliamentarian, an Australian parliamentarian, walked out in protest. You're saying we're corrupt. No, it's not corruption. It's called capture, industry capture. Industry capture is very easily achieved. If, you're, if your ch daughter was goes to school, say a private school, and the daughter of the minister also goes to a private school, you will know that person. And you can talk. And you can say, well, you know, John, because it will be John, uh, uh, I have a little problem, and uh, yeah, we can arrange that. And pop, a little subsidy come in, and if you reduce the subsidies line, if you if you reduce the cost line, that's what it does. Well, cost the subsidy reduce the cost line. You generate profit for this company, but uh, you have less fish. And you have an absurd situation that you can actually continue to earn money that are subsidies, taxpayers' money, and catch no fish at the end. So this fish that we saw uh, in a previous contribution, they make good money. But they make good money because uh, an economic context is contrived where they make money overfishing. But they shouldn't. If, if the market were really free, without subsidies, they would go bankrupt all of them. Next. 
So we can actually, we know how to deal with subsidies, with, with fisheries issues. We do not, we should not subsidize. And rooting out subsidies is kind of difficult because you have to look. They, they are not never called subsidies to my buddies. They're in a bunch of they are not called. They are, I think they are different names. <laughs> but if a fishery is subsidized, that is because it is overexploited. At the beginning, of, when a fishery uh, uh, is fishing uh, an abundance of fish. They they are making so much money they don't they, they don't even talk to their friend in the ministry, so they don't they don't need to. But as soon as the shoes have start to hurt, that means as soon as the resource goes down, that they turn to the ministry and get support. And then we can assess the stock and set conservative quota to rebuild them. This. This we know how to do. Fishery science knows how to do it, and uh, therefore could do it if the minister were not constantly intervening. And in the U.S., we, uh, lots of weird stuff is happening all the time in the U.S., but they have actually the best fishery management regime in the world. And uh, this comes from the uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act, which forces the the managers to rebuild stock as soon as uh, bull fishing is identified to the level that produce maximum sustainable yield. That happens, and this the quota must be defined such that it happens within 10 years. So if the quota is too high, that the stock could not be rebuilt within 10 years, then you can sue. And in the US, the uh, civil society, the NGO community can sue the government because the quota had to run. Now, Canada passed a, a law similar to that last year, or the year before. However, the, the minister prerogative to intervene was maintained. And that means it would not work. Uh, in Europe, uh, uh, similar legislation was passed, but the Council of Ministers at the uh, EU level still has a last word, and in the last minute, they always intervene to increase the quota, so the stocks are not rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, to set up marine reserve to maintain biodiversity, and it also helps with ocean warming. And rather than allow questions now, which I will at the end, I will go into ocean warming and uh, give you the, the broad context of that. Next. So, uh, uh, I should mention, yeah, uh, you know, Britney Spears, uh, 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 she got uh, uh, she got access to her baby. Didn't she? Yeah. At some point, uh, there was a divorce. Or, anyway, she had no access to her baby. And uh, Al Gore was just going to make an announcement about the Arctic melting. And, uh, and uh, Britney Spears uh, beat her. And uh, Albo was very mad about that. And I was in, in Hollywood at some fundraiser with Albo, and he was mad about Britney Spears getting, <laughs> getting all the attention while, uh, while his announcement. Anyway, he got the Nobel Prize two weeks later, and he's happy. <laughs> Next. Um, so, what happens is. Uh, that is the North Sea, uh, the fish are moving north. The, the centroid of the distribution is moving north at uh, a speed of about 50 kilometers, uh, 50 to, five to 50 kilometers per, per year. And it's it quite rapid, and you will see that. And uh, in, in a, few, a few years ago, you got this into science. This is uh, uh, not uh, the most prestigious journal. Nowadays, you would get it in BC studies only because, because it happens everywhere and it would be more sense. Next. So, um, I had a postdoc who was from Hong Kong and his favorite fish was this uh, croaker. Uh, and uh, we mapped it. And you can see that it occurs uh, north of Taiwan, north in North Korea, in South Korea, not in, China, not in Japan, but along the the uh, East China Sea and the Yellow Sea. 
And because of this distribution, we can say that it occurs, it lacks 15 degrees temperature. Now this postdoc then took, uh, this distribution map is uh, used half degree cells for uh, latitude longitude for expressing distribution. We do that with all our fish. We, uh, we distribute the catch uh, over 150,000 cells to work this uh, uh, ocean. And uh, this student decided, uh, this postdoc, then uh, had created in each of these cells a little population model that, uh, that produce larvae if the temperature is right. And uh, the temperature is right, you produce no larvae, no fish, no larvae. And uh, if the temperature is not right, you die. And uh, we use the temperature that was predicted uh, from uh, in one of these big ocean uh, models and that we got with, from our colleague in Princeton. And then we put that together and like before. Uh, I actually don't have to press anything. Uh, it moves by itself. And you can see the fish invading North Korea. Uh, you would never want to do that. And they are in southern Japan and they are leaving Taiwan. So that is what is happening all over the world with all fish. No exception that is happening because temperature, and it is it has begun to happen in the 70s. It's not uh, there is some quick that keeps saying that global warming is well, it has the fish know that and they have a brain of this size. <laughs> okay, next. So if you if you deal with all if you deal with all fish, uh, there is about a thousand of them here. The the what will be invaded is the pole, obviously, and uh, that what will be what will be where there will be fish loss is the tropics, obviously, because in the tropics the fish that leave because it's too hot are not replaced by some fish that are coming from hypertropic because they don't exist. So these maps, we produce these maps, and they were the were the first maps showing the effect of global warming on fisheries globally. Next. And uh, on biodiversity, sorry. And on fisheries, well, the tropics will see fisheries go, uh, go down, whereas the other countries will see some fish replaced by some other fish. And it is happening of BC. For example, we get uh, we get Humboldt squid, the giant squid that sometimes uh, shows up in summer, and everybody writes to the Vancouver Sun and asks what the heck that is. Well, this is this is uh, this is a Mexican, <laughs> this is a Mexican uh, immigrant uh, <laughs> for all purpose. Uh, and so this this thing was uh, was the first map showing catch the potential, the change of catch potential, and and and. Uh, BC, you can see, we will we will lose the salmon. Uh, it has begun in in California, they lost theirs and so on. Alaska will be doing fine, and they will establish themselves in the Arctic. So you have to be nice to the Inuit. So you can, uh, next, next, and you can see the change that are projected. Uh, the the change in countries that are in a temperate zone. Are, are small because uh, because uh, the fish that leave will be replaced by fish that come. But uh, other countries that are at the end, for example, Norway, it's only the Norwegian that win and so on, and such things. Norway will benefit from it and so on. I'm almost done. Uh, next. So we can, we know what happens, we can understand what will happen in this. For example, if you look at Yolikon, uh, uh, Yolikon uh, has, in the last years, it has, uh, uh, the, it, it, uh, has changed the period at which it uh, gets uh, back into the rivers. Uh, this was done by a, a First Nation student that we had uh, in a very nice thesis uh, in, uh, from Belakula. Next. 
And uh, you can show that uh, of the Ulicon stocks, imagine that as herring stocks, since we're doing herring first, but uh, Ulicon stocks are doing next, doing very well in the south and doing badly in the north. No, just the opposite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, in Australia, I did that in black, right? <laughs> next. So you see the south. The southern rivers are doing very badly over time, and uh, the north are doing okay, is doing okay. And that is uh, what will happen, what also happens with salmon. That is what happens to basically to all species. In the world. And, and it is not something that will happen later. This is happening right now, and it has begun already in the 70s and the Next. So another thing that will happen is the fish are shrinking. And uh, we wrote a, a, a paper, and we we made uh, a memo a little bit shrinking. And uh, why are they shrinking? Uh, next, because uh, fish uh, breathe through gills, and gills are very complicated machine machinery. Uh, it's very difficult for fish to get the oxygen into their body that they need, because there is not much oxygen in the air, uh, in water about 80%, 80, 80 times less than in air. When we breathe, this is not work. But uh, a fish has to work 80 times more, more to get this stuff into its body. Next. And so, uh, because a, a fish has, when it gets bigger, less gill per area, because the gill don't grow as fast as the body. Don't ask me why it's too long. Uh, but uh, essentially, the bigger fish have less gill per area. And so they, the bigger they get, the more difficult it is for them to breathe. So if you increase the temperature on a fish, it will need more oxygen. But uh, they cannot get it. So they remain small. Uh, if you are interested in this, I, I have a few books about it. Next. And, uh, Basically, we have we have uh, shown that the fish throughout the world will shrink, uh, and uh, this is also happening. Next, <coughs> and that's the last point. Global warming is not something that will happen. I mentioned that, but it's already happening, and so <coughs> that's the part that I've looked up since uh, the seventies. Next. So uh, we wrote a paper in Nature. Uh, I will show that because it's very difficult to do a paper in Nature in that term, uh, in, we, in which we invented a new concept. Next. And that concept is called the mean temperature of the catch. Because each fish has a preferred temperature, like this yellow croaker, it had 15. And they don't like any other temperature, and they cannot change rapidly. I'm talking about it hundred thousands of years. They cannot change the, the temperature at which they are more efficient. So basically, a fish has a certain temperature, and you can calculate, if you have a catch of certain, of a mixed catch, you can calculate the mean temperature of the catch. Why? The, you, if you have a fish in Hornby Island, it will catch fish that like 10 degree, 5 degree, 12 degrees, 15 degrees, a certain mixture. Next. Well, uh, if you look up, the temperature, the sea surface temperature, uh, since the 70s has increased. And in, in temperate areas and, and tropical, subtropical areas, the mean temperature of the catch has also increased. In other words, the fish that you catch now offshore reflect the temperature that increase of the water itself. But in the tropics, it's not the case. Because, because uh, the temperature increased, but there is no fish coming from the harbor tropic. And so the temperature of the catch is flat. And that you can show even with the lousy data that I spoke about, FAO, the FAO data. So if, even with lousy data, you can show it. Mm -hmm. And so you can be sure that it happens. Next. And the result of all this is like that. If you look at the left, the temperate area and subtropical area, they were catching lots of 
fish that like cold water and a few fish that like warm water. Well, this has changed. Uh, and uh, we have more tropical and subtropical fish. And in the future, we will have only subtropical fish. And in the tropics, and I remind you, this is where most people live that are poor mm -hmm. and, um, and that need fish. They had tropical fish to start with, less fish now, it has begun, and in the future, they will have very little. That's the summary of all of this. And uh, the issue is what you have identified, is to fight for maintaining your local stock. But you also have to fight for, for Canada becoming not becoming a, a petrol state. Uh, because if it becomes a petrol state, this will happen for sure. This is not a projection, but it will happen for sure. If Canada and the US and, uh, do not understand the need to reduce emission, the, these bad things will all happen. Next, mm -hmm. I think I'm done. Ah, one last slide. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a little paper, one page, uh, that uh, described what I, what I call the shifting baseline scene. The fact that every generation, let's take N1, uh, you have young people here, a few, uh, and uh, they see the world when they're young, they perceive it. And then they grow, they live, they become old, and the change that they note only is the change that they notice during their lifetime. They don't notice the change that happened during their parents' lifetime or their grandparents' lifetime. And so they would tend to say, if, if you ask N2, what are the changes that happen? Well, this is a change between the arrow and the solid line, but the change before, they don't notice. And this shifting baseline is the reason why we accept the inacceptable. Because we don't believe that stuff has happened before. That was even bigger. The changes were even bigger. And so we talk about, oh, that we have lost this since the 80s. But in the 80s, were already they had already wiped out lots of stocks in, in the Georgia Strait. Next. Uh, uh, and one word about aquaculture. Given that most aquaculture, or much of aquaculture, is fed from fisheries, it will not alleviate the problem of fisheries. And in fact, lots of people say, oh, aquaculture will solve the problem, will feed the world. Well, actually, won't, because, because much of the fish that is produced in aquaculture consumes more fish as food than is produced in aquaculture. So, now I'm done. I think. Yes. I, uh, I want to say, NSERC has not, and Canada has not funded government grant funding. I've always been funded by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by foundation, the Q, the Paul Allen Family Foundation, and so on. And uh, I, uh, most of my staff are young ladies. Some people go. Uh, thank you very much.